The two fundamental modes of human experience are that of joy and sorrow. As human beings, we naturally strive to bring ourselves into a state of the former and away from the latter. On an experiential level, we recognize these two as opposites, unable to coexist, fighting for dominance in our lives. Throughout our existence, we have come to identify those forces in the world and within us which move us towards one or the other. These have come to be known broadly as good and evil. The ancient Jewish mystical text, the Kabbalah, asserts that there is no greater good than joy and no greater evil than sorrow. As the physical world was believed to be an extension of the spirit world, the agents of joy and sorrow were attributed to the supernatural, and thus was conceived a host of spirits who presided over these respective domains. Since man's earliest religious notions, he has maintained the existence of two main classes of spirit beings, those who were good, who by their nature sought to aid humanity, and those who were evil, who sought to harm. They were regarded generally as immortal beings of a semi-divine race distinct from humans. Today, they are most commonly referred to as angels and demons. Most cultures throughout human history have had some concept of them. While cross-cultural interpretations of their origin and nature significantly vary, we can nonetheless see a distinct pattern of the general belief in good and evil spirits. In this episode, we will focus on what have come to be known as demons, dark, tempestuous beings which, from time immemorial, have struck fear and awe into the heart of humanity. Despite the efforts of rationalists to ward away demons to the realm of superstition and religious fanaticism, they remain firmly embedded in our culture, in our collective psyche, and even in our experience. A 2016 Gallup poll revealed that more than 60% of Americans believe in the existence of hell and the devil, and a public policy polling survey from 2012 showed that 57% of Americans believe in demonic possession. Even for the non-believers, demons continued to spark morbid fascination, as evidenced in their prevalence in pop culture. At a minimum, the concept of demons remains a potent allegorical tool in framing human experience, and at most, they continue to haunt us in the present day. Welcome to the Hidden Passage. The ancient concept of demons was much different than the later interpretations that became prevalent in the Christian world. Many of the world's oldest religions' belief in what we might equate to demons were depicted as morally ambivalent in terms of their interaction with humans, more akin to the fairies described in earlier episodes. In fact, the word demon itself originates from the Greek daimon 
meaning lesser deity or guiding spirit. They were known to be helpful guardian spirits. Christianity appropriated the word, and many of the gods and nature spirits of pagan religions were declared to be demons. This conflation can be illustrated by comparing the elementals and their kingdoms described by Paracelsus with a similar categorization of demons in their respective realms described by the Byzantine monk Psellos. Here they are ordered according to their physical location from highest to lowest, which also corresponds to their power. Lelioria, located beyond the moon, was the highest demonic realm of an etheric essence, the invisible counterpart to matter, where the most powerful demons dwelled. Area was the next realm just below it. This is where the demons of the air lived. Cthonia was the home of the demons of the earth. Hyrea was the realm of water in which another order of demons resided. Bipakthbonia was a type of underworld where certain demons lived underground. Mesophes was the true hell, which was located below the underworld, where blind and almost senseless demons were said to exist. In the initial period of Christianization, we see a literal demonization of pagan idols used as a rhetorical tool in the emerging narrative created to delegitimize pagandom. There are legends wherein the true identity of the so-called gods is exposed. In one story regarding St. Patrick, the renowned saint ascends the hill of Crom Cruach, a pagan Irish god who was alleged to have been propitiated by human sacrifice, and in one instance had struck dead an entire group of worshippers. It is said that St. Patrick destroyed the standing stone of the mound of Crom Cruach, causing the demon to emerge, drooping and bowing at the feet of the saint. A similar theme can be seen in the story of Simon Magus, the Gnostic magician mentioned in the New Testament. In one instance, he was said to have levitated in the air in an attempt to ascend to heaven and prove his spiritual superiority. Saint Peter, who had witnessed the event, ordered the evil spirits assisting Simon to release their hold, causing him to plummet to his death, thus exposing his power as inferior and merely the work of in demons. The name of the Almighty God, release your hold of clean spirits. These stories are not considered to have any basis in historical fact, and were likely manufactured to help establish the supremacy of Christendom. Despite this fact, not all demons were simply mislabeled pagan gods, as the belief in evil spirits is shared among most pre-Christian religions, going back to our earliest historical records. The word demon itself does not directly translate across cultures, although there are some terms used to describe approximately similar beings. For the purposes of simplicity, we will most often use the term demon to variously describe supernatural, malicious entities. It is possible that many cultures were invariably describing the same thing. The first known records of demons comes from the Mesopotamians, an ancient civilization dating back to 4500 BC. Quote, the Mesopotamian worldview included both harmful and benevolent demons and spirits who actively interfered with the everyday life of the Mesopotamian people. Andras Bakse. 
they were referred to as the Gala and resided in the underworld. The underworld was a common belief shared among many ancient cultures, conceived as a dark and dreary realm where the souls of most human beings went after death. It was unique from most later concepts of heaven and hell. It was also ambiguous in that it was not idyllic, nor was it particularly inhospitable, and it was not associated with cosmic punishment or reward. The Mesopotamian underworld, however, was a particularly unpleasant place, and its human inhabitants subsisted on nothing but dust. The rites of offering libation by pouring out drinks onto the ground was done so that it might reach the parched ancestors below. The larger realm in which demons occupied was called the Netherworld, positioned between human beings and the divine, and so demons were regarded as intermediary, or Zwischenwesen creatures, allowed to move freely between the Netherworld and the heavens. In moving between these two, they were able to influence Earth. These creatures were also considered to live outside the civilized world, on the fringes of creation. It is traditionally held that in the world of spirit, things that are evil manifest as ugliness, and things that are good manifest as beauty. Demons, like the gods, had human and animal characteristics, but were different in that they usually appeared more animalistic. They were described as fearsome and often grotesque beings, anthropomorphic in nature, usually with the more menacing physical attributes of several animals combined to represent their chaotic and ferocious nature. The Mesopotamian Pazuzu was a demon portrayed with a canine-like face, bulging eyes, scaly skin, clawed talons, and a poisonous serpent-headed penis. The inversion of the phallus, a sacred symbol of divine generation, to an instrument of death, speaks much to the nature of the demonic, as a spirit of opposition. Similarly, the demoness Lamashtu was said to feed on the blood of infants, which is an inversion of the Divine Mother archetype, who devours rather than nurtures. The animals to whom their attributes belonged tended to represent the demon's character as well being those that lived in the deep, dark places of the world, in the ground and underwater. There are symbolic connotations worth mentioning here. Animals such as poisonous snakes and insects are lethal to humans and live in darkness. Poison symbolizes death, and darkness symbolizes ignorance, as it obscures from sight. Ignorance breeds spiritual death, just as dangerous creatures breed in the dark. Low places are often synonymous with separation from the divine. Therefore, malevolent spirits are universally considered to exist in lower realms. Set, the evil Egyptian god who slayed Osiris, bore the head of a saltwater crocodile an animal known for its aggressiveness and tendency to attack and kill human beings. In contrast, birds, animals that could fly, a reflection of their elevated spirit, were seen as sacred and pure, and so many gods and benevolent spirits are depicted with wings. Thoth, with the head of an ibis, was a god of supreme wisdom. Wisdom being a product of spiritual illumination. Nonetheless, the earth was thought to be the sacred womb of life. Each principle has a creative or destructive aspect, depending on the degree of its expression, 
which is dictated by context. For instance, the feminine earth nurtures life, but in its destructive form becomes the devouring mother. This is displayed in nature constantly. All things are eventually consumed by the earth that bore them. The seed without the proper balance of sunlight and soil does not grow. Each element in excess can destroy it, but in moderate balance nurtures. The seed then sprouts, reaching up through the ground and blossoming into a flower. This was the path and the goal of the human spirit, according to many of the mystery traditions, to ascend and meet the source, the eternal light of the world. Heaven was something that could only be reached through the great work of spiritual transformation. The demons of the ancient world were divided in their purpose. Most acted in service to the gods, but there were others who did not. The Mesopotamian Namtara, Galu, and Rubisu demons were the messengers of the god Enlil, acting as the proxies of divine wrath. The Utuku and Asaku demons, however, were sovereign and acted on their own accord. In Egyptian mythology, we see a similar distinction between two main groups of demons. The first were known as the Guardians. These beings were bound to a specific sacred place. Many were known to guard the halls of Osiris in the afterlife. The Guardians would ferociously defend these places against the unworthy who attempted to enter. This concept is similar to the Baltic Draugrs and Celtic Fairies, who guarded the tombs and treasures within the earth against grave robbers. To those who possessed the necessary moral character or secret knowledge, and who would come to make a claim rightfully, the Guardians would allow entry and appear benevolent. Again, we see context is key. The second main group of demons was known as the Wanderers. In contrast to the Guardians, these beings sought out humans and brought with them death, destruction, and corruption. Like the Guardians, they could be instructed by the gods to punish the immoral. However, there were Wanderers who acted on their own accord. In this form, they were regarded as agents of chaos the destructive, unraveling force in contradistinction to the creative, ordering force of the divine. Magic could be used to defend against and drive away the wanderers. A similar group of entities in Hinduism are known as the Asuras, in contrast to the Devas, or heavenly beings. The Asuras do not appear to be outright evil, but have the potential to be good or bad. Both the Asuras and the Devas come from the same divine parentage. There are also cases of Asuras becoming very enlightened beings. Their negative aspect is born out of or drawn to the immoral thoughts and actions of people. Again, we see this idea that evil spirits' engagement with people is not arbitrarily malicious, but a consequence of ill-gotten action and thought. Demons from all cultures were known to cause misfortune, illness, and death. The Mesopotamian healing apotropaic texts identifies them as the cause of a variety of diseases. There was a significant degree of specificity in these attributions. For instance, the Alu demon was believed to specifically cause strokes. Lamastu, the child eater, 
was thought to be the cause of what we now know as sudden infant death syndrome. This belief remained prevalent throughout the Middle Ages in Europe. While medicine in the Middle Ages was experimental, attributing illnesses to a wide variety of causes from the terrestrial to the supernatural, demons were certainly a part of the dialogue and were often connected to afflictions of the mind or illnesses of a sudden, inexplicable nature. Recall the concept of elf shot from an earlier episode, which was later adapted by Christians and assigned to demons. In the ancient world, demons, while they were acknowledged, were not nearly as prevalent, nor were they seen as the existential threat that later came to be the cultural zeitgeist of medieval Europe. Any problem they did pose appeared to have a relatively simple solution. The most consequential shift came about with the rise of Catholicism. While these beings still existed in Judaism and early forms of Christianity, they were not articulated as the great existential threat that we think of today. This traces back to the pivotal distinction put forth by the church that demons were fallen angels in open rebellion against God. Demons were now seen as powerful angels who were completely turned over to evil. Instead of acting on behalf of the deity, they were actively seeking to undermine him, to corrupt and destroy mankind. Their leader, the great adversary, was Satan. It is taught in Christianity that Satan was once the most glorious and exalted angel in heaven. Ezekiel 28 reads, Moreover the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were a signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of the fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of the fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. Further basis for this interpretation can be found in Isaiah 14. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Those who see you stare at you, they ponder your fate. Is this the man who shook the earth and made the kingdoms tremble? Taken in context, these passages appear to be referring to the human kings of Tyre and Babylon, who it is said in their hubris were struck down by God. But to the Catholic Church, these passages had a double meaning, also referring to a fall of Satan from heaven. They translated his original name as Lucifer, 
taken from the phrase Morning Star, both of which had their roots in the ancient names for Venus. From these passages, it was further extrapolated that Lucifer had become prideful and refused to bow to God, or that he became jealous that God favored man, or that he became enamored with his own magnificence and desired to bring glory to himself instead of God. Whatever the case, the ultimate sin was pride, and for this, he and those angels who sided with him were cast down from heaven. From then on, Lucifer and his ilk became increasingly corrupted until he finally assumed the form of Satan and became the origin of all evil in the world. Interestingly, the idea of a cosmic rebellion against God was not without historical precedence. In the Sumerian Lugale myth, the demon Asaku, quote, opposes the word order created by Enlil and launches an attack against the gods with the help of a self-created stone army, Vanjik. He achieves this by procreating with a mountain. The account states that during this war, the sun and moon disappeared from the sky, and the day became blacker than night, and the surface of the earth was gashed with terrible wounds. This was the end of the first age in Mesopotamian myth. This bears resemblance to the catastrophic end of the first age in Greco-Roman myth we discussed in the last episode, also initiated by a cosmic rebellion. The Christian worldview saw mankind in the midst of a titanic struggle between the forces of good and evil. This philosophy began to be developed in the New Testament Judaism. The most dramatic illustration can be seen in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which explain in great detail the apocalyptic conclusion of this struggle in a large-scale war between angels and demons at the end of days. The Catholic Church later solidified this belief. This new concept of the demon meant that they were actively seeking to corrupt and destroy humanity, and that anyone, including the innocent, could be a victim of demonic attack. Evil was always seeking to gain a foothold in the world, and so prayer, worship, and obedience to God had to be constantly maintained to counter it. This concept was coined spiritual warfare. The Catholic Encyclopedia explains the complexity of mankind's ambivalence in this battle. Quote, Man is in various ways subject to the influence of evil spirits. He brought himself into captivity under the power of him who thence, from the time of Adam's transgression, had the empire of death, which is to say, the devil, and was, through the fear of death, all his lifetime subject to servitude. Even though redeemed by Christ, he is subject to violent temptation, for our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the world of this darkness, against the spirits of wickedness in the high places. Here we see the greater spiritual war reflected within man himself. This new concept created paranoia. Fear kept the masses under the purview of the church as any deviation from the orthodoxy removed their only protection against this evil force. The most likely way for demons to gain influence over a person was through temptation to sin. Just as the serpent had tempted Eve in the garden, 
a phenomenon in medieval Europe emerged of women allegedly being seduced by the devil. Because of this, it was believed that women more readily gave in to temptation than men, and that the devil, knowing this, most often engaged with women. This belief formed the basis for many accusations of witchcraft in the Middle Ages. Confessions of a licentious nature were recorded in the 1640s. Ellen Driver confessed that, quote, after she was married to the devil, he had carnal use of her, but was cold. She further said that being in bed with him, she felt his feet, and they were cloven. Elizabeth Clark allegedly had sex with Satan routinely. Anne Borum claimed to have seen two small demons fighting each other, and the winner then claimed the use of her body. Quote, All through the Middle Ages, councils continued to discuss the matter. Laws were passed and penalties decreed against all who invited the influence of the devil, or utilized it to inflict injury on their fellow man, and the powers of exorcism were conferred on every priest in the church. The phenomenon was accepted as real by all Christians. The records of criminal investigations alone in which charges of witchcraft or diabolical possession formed a prominent part that would fill volumes. The Catholic Encyclopedia. The Catholic Church formed a special order of exorcists in response to this perceived crisis. Exorcism, or the expulsion of a spirit from a person or place, is a religious rite which can be seen as far back as ancient Mesopotamia, where incantations designed to exorcise demons were recorded. Jesus Christ was known to have unprecedented power over all unclean spirits, performing a number of exorcisms for the demonically afflicted. In one famous account, known as the Exorcism of Legion, or the miracle of swine. Jesus approached a possessed man who had been known to exhibit strange abilities and behaviors. The man was too strong to be bound, and quote, night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry and cut himself with stones. Jesus called upon the demon to leave the man, and asked the entity to give its name, to which it responded, My name is Legion, for we are many. The demon then begged Jesus not to send him back, but rather into a herd of swine. Jesus agreed, and suddenly the pig stirred into a frenzy, running off a cliff into the sea where they drowned. The Catholic Church has identified various means by which demons can influence human beings. Quote, he may attack a man's body from without or assume control from within. One external method of assault is the infliction of physical pain, often resulting in the scratching or bruising of the victim. Another is known as infestation or haunting of the victim's home. The demon in this case will vandalize objects and scare animals. Lastly is oppression, which is the causing of misfortune in matters of business, health, and relationships. Internal methods of attack are obsession and possession. Obsession describes the demon's ability to implant foreign thoughts into the victim's mind, usually of an irrational, obsessive, or sinful nature. They are also ascribed the ability to manipulate dreams, 
causing the victim to experience bizarre nightmares of a horrific and violent nature. This psychic attack culminates in causing suicidal ideation. It is thought that a demon will use a variety of methods to slowly dominate their victim, breaking him or her down into a state of desperation. At this point, their spiritual defenses are weakened, rendering them more susceptible to possession, which is often the demon's ultimate goal. Father Jordan Amon defines diabolical possession as, quote, a phenomenon in which the devil invades the body of a living person and moves the faculties and organs as if he were manipulating a body of his own. The devil truly resides within the body of the unfortunate victim and he operates in it and treats it as his own property. The belief in possession is a worldwide phenomenon. A study by the National Institute of Mental Health documented spirit possession beliefs in 74% of a sample of 488 societies in all parts of the world. Historically, this could be seen as either beneficial or detrimental to the host. In many cases, such as the Greek oracles, the individual was believed to be possessed by a god who would bestow wisdom. Any type of spirit, be it human or non-human, could potentially do this, for good or for nefarious purposes. A notable example of an evil possessing spirit in a pre-Christian culture is the Native American Wendigo, who was believed to impel its victims to engage in cannibalism. <laughs> Demonic possession, according to most ecumenical sources, often occurs intermittently, in that the demon is always attached to the victim, but only takes control of the body at certain times. Quote, During the course of diabolical possession, and even the exorcism, the person has not only periods of crisis when the struggle with evil is most apparent, but also periods of calm when one thinks the possession has ended. Interestingly, after the exorcism, the person does not remember what transpired while being possessed. William Saunders When control over the body is taken, the victim will suffer seizures resembling epilepsy and loss of consciousness. In some cases, like the man who Jesus exercised, a person can be possessed by more than one entity. The most extreme form of possession is known as perfect possession. This is when the demon assumes full and permanent control over a person, and the two become fully integrated with one another in a symbiotic, shared commitment to evil. This can only happen if an individual has willingly accepted the demon into them and agrees to cooperate. Notable exorcist Father Malachi Martin stated that in cases of perfect possession, there is nothing that he can do to save the person. A possessed individual is thought to exhibit a variety of preternatural abilities such as abnormal strength, telekinesis, and levitation. The possessed person has the ability to reveal hidden knowledge that he or she could not possibly know and speak in archaic languages, specifically Aramaic or Latin. A possessed person is thought to take on a vulgar and rageful personality, expressing blasphemous sentiments and an aversion to biblical iconography and sacrament. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. The Catholic Church has trained exorcists to look for these phenomena in diagnosing a true case of possession. In the modern scientific age, extra caution is allegedly taken in distinguishing possession from mental illness. According to the church, such evidence must first be observed which cannot be explained by any other rational means. Only when psychiatric and medical assessments have ruled out illness and all conventional treatments are exhausted, does the church move forward with an exorcism. This prerequisite is known as moral certainty. The practice of exorcism is alive and well today, with leading Catholic figures claiming that the number of required exorcisms is on the rise. This is attributed to the rise of New Age spiritualism, neo-paganism, Satanism, and an increasing interest in the occult. Father James Labar, Archdiocese of New York, claims that he has seen an explosion of cases since the 1990s. The following passage detailing the process of exorcism is taken from Father Martin's biography, The Jesuits. Quote, Attending the priests are at least six laymen, usually selected more for their physical prowess than for their theological knowledge. Exorcism can be extremely violent, says Father Martin. It is often disturbing and always exhausting. I have seen objects hurled around rooms by the powers of evil. I have smelt the breath of Satan and heard the demons' voices, cold, scratchy, dead voices, carrying the messages of hatred. I have watched men writhing, screaming, vomiting, defecating as we fought for their souls. Like a mongoose playing a cobra, the priest will attempt to work the demon into a position first of disadvantage, then of vulnerability. He begins by demanding, with the authority of prayer, to know its name. The demons, says Father Martin, are not always willing to play this game. They lie, silent, sullen, and hidden. When this happens, the exorcist must provoke them into breaking cover. Quote, you have to tease them out. The demon does not physically inhabit the body. It possesses the person's will. We have to compel the thing to reveal itself and its purpose. It can be slow and difficult, with the demon taunting, scorning, and abusing you. Speaking through the mouth of the possessed, but not in his or her voice. In the end, though, it does come out, and when that happens, you experience the sensation we call presence. At that moment, you know you are in the company of the purest evil. I have felt the claws of invisible animals tearing at my face. I have been knocked off my feet, blinded and winded. But it is then, when you sense the presence, that the real attack on the demon can begin. The theory of exorcism holds that once a demon has been drawn out of the body, it can be vanquished by the power of prayer. The whole nature of the thing changes, says Father Martin. The demon knows it's losing. Instead of screaming abuse, it begins to plead for mercy. It says it's sorry. It begs to be spared. It promises to go home. But the Bible says that only on the last day can the followers of Satan return to hell. Where they go, I do not know. We do not destroy them, we drive them out. Sometimes I encounter the same ones again. As the demon disappears, the person it is possessed is cleared, and a wondrous wave of peace comes over them. 
In the 1400s, Europeans felt a calling to develop a more active spirituality and explore beyond the boundaries of the church. With the Renaissance came a renewed interest in the wisdom of antiquity. While the mystery schools as institutions were long defunct, some of their secret esoteric philosophy was preserved, and its rediscovery spurred a revival of the magical arts based on the traditions of ancient Egypt, Greece, and Judea. The ideas contained therein had a profound impact on Western philosophy, science, and art, influencing the works of some of the greatest minds of the age. Among the ancient practices which were revived was the invocation and controlling of spirits. The act of bringing a spirit under the control of a magical practitioner is known as binding. This was done for a variety of purposes, including gaining knowledge or power, spiritual transformation, and exerting influence over the physical world. Through exhaustive experimentation, these medieval magicians developed a complex system of ritualistic formulas designed for this purpose, which they believed had to be followed with a scientific precision. These methods were recorded in what are known as grimoires. For a time, invoking demons was not seen as evil. In fact, many of the Christian priests engaged in such practices, seeking to bring evil powers under their control in order to do good. The greatest influence on this philosophy was the legacy of Solomon, the renowned king of Israel featured in the Old Testament. He was considered to be the wisest man who ever lived. As the legend goes, Solomon summoned 72 evil spirits, commanding them to reveal their identities and trapping them within a brass vessel, which he later cast into the sea to prevent them from wreaking havoc on earth. It is said, however, that the vessel was eventually found by fishermen who opened it and unwittingly released the spirits back into the world. This story is the basis for the tale of the genie, or gin, in a bottle. Along with each spirit's name was revealed their signifying symbol, or seal, which could be used to summon them at will. Allegedly, Solomon used these spirits to aid in the construction of Solomon's temple, one of the original wonders of the world. In the mid-16th century, a grimoire known as the Lamegaton, or Lesser Key of Solomon, was anonymously published purporting to contain the original seals and invocations of Solomon himself. This text was foundational in the development of the Goetia school of magic, which dealt specifically with the conjuration of demons. Goetia would come to be seen as an ignoble practice in society and heretical in the eyes of the church. Of the most notorious magicians in the Middle Ages known to have practiced the Goetic arts was the German doctor Johannes Faust. Faust is undoubtedly most well known for bringing the idea of the spirit contract into the public mind. Through his writings, it is explained that to bind the spirit to the magician most effectively, a pact must be made between the spirit and the practitioner which guarantees the spirit's subservience for the duration of the magician's life in exchange for his or her soul at the time of death, at which point he or she becomes the property of said spirit. Dr. Faust famously made such a deal. The following quote is taken from his personal account of the exchange. At first, I had little faith that what was promised would take place. 
But at the very first invocation which I attempted, a mighty spirit manifested to me, desiring to know why I had invoked him. His coming so amazed me that I scarcely knew what to say. But finally I asked him if he would serve me in my magical investigations. He replied that if certain conditions were agreed upon, he would. The conditions were that I should make a pact with him. This I did not desire to do, but as in my ignorance, I had not protected myself with a circle and was actually at the mercy of the spirit. I did not dare refuse his request and resigned myself to the inevitable, considering it wisest to turn my mantle according to the wind. I then told him that if he would be serviceable to me according to my desires and needs for a certain length of time, I would sign myself over to him. The Goetic spirits were often invoked for worldly gratification. Being the closest to the physical realm of all the spirits, they were believed to have the most direct influence over it and possessed uncanny knowledge of all the sciences. Among the abilities in their purview was bringing wealth and power to the magician, and to exert control over anything from the weather to the thoughts and behaviors of others. Cautionary tales have been recorded of the foolhardy magician who is inevitably swallowed up by the forces of chaos which he unleashes. A common motif is that the spirit fulfills the request of the sorcerer, but the lack of his foresight causes the result to manifest in such a way that the unintended consequences outweigh any possible benefit. The spirit has no real interest in serving the magician, and if anything, seeks to undermine him. The magician, while aware of this fact, believes that he can use his inherent spiritual authority and occult knowledge to effectively conform the spirit to his will and succeed in the gambit unscathed. A battle of wits ensues. Cunning by nature, the spirit invariably finds a proverbial chink in the magician's armor, inevitably causing his undoing. Having bartered his eternity for temporal power, the magician goes to drastic lengths to prolong his mortal life and avoid his fate. An interesting aspect of these entities conjured by medieval sorcerers was their apparent indifference towards human beings. Their accounts portray demons as sophisticated beings from some distant realm with greater concerns than trifling with mankind. It seems they did not tempt the magician to do anything. In fact, the demon Mephisto, who was said to have worked with Faust, allegedly petitioned against some of the unscrupulous things that he had desired to do. A more nuanced view of demons was put forth by Paracelsus. Paracelsus, the chosen moniker of the Swiss Theophrastus von Hohenheim, who lived in Germany at the turn of the 16th century, was not only a mystic philosopher, schooled by the Greeks and the Egyptians, but was also a renowned physician, who was famous for his attempts to blend science and spiritualism in a truly innovative approach to medicine. Though maligned by his colleagues at the time, his ability to heal where others had failed to do so spoke for itself. In his view, demonic oppression was initiated by the oppressed individual themselves. These creatures, referred to by Paracelsus as spiritual larvae, 
were either attracted to or literally created out of the person's own degeneracy. This included all forms of extreme action and thought, which were considered to be a misuse of the physio-psychological powers. This misuse, in all its forms, invariably drained and or dysregulated one's invisible metaphysical energies, which then caused visible physical disease. Sin and vice fall into this category, but here the emphasis is on the damaging effect rather than the moral implications. These entities were believed to be parasitic by nature, feeding off the energy that was discharged as a result of such behavior. For this reason, they were thought to linger around dive bars, brothels, and drug dens, waiting for easy prey. Paracelsus also acknowledged their ability to incite their targets through psychic manipulation, creating a vicious cycle that drove the victim further into depravity and hindered their ability to recover. They could also seek out a person in their sleep, igniting their passions through dreams. A notorious example of such a being is the succubus and incubus, female and male respectively, which were demons that visited people at night and drained their energy through sexual contact. This description as spiritual larvae is significant in that it presents them as relatively insignificant entities trying to survive and feed as any animal would. He wrote that, quote, A healthy and pure person cannot become obsessed by them, because such larvae can only act upon men if the latter make room for them in their minds. A healthy mind is a castle that cannot be invaded without the will of its master. But if they are allowed to enter, they excite the passions of men and women. They create cravings in them. They produce bad thoughts which act injuriously upon the brain. They sharpen the animal intellect and suffocate the moral sense. Evil spirits only obsess those human beings in whom the animal nature is predominant. Minds that are illuminated by the spirit of truth cannot be possessed. Only those who are habitually guided by their lower impulses may become subject to their influences. Thank you all for listening. I just want to welcome all of my new subscribers and thank you for the awesome feedback and it really makes me happy that you guys are enjoying the content because I've been doing this for a little while um, without really getting much exposure. So it's kind of crazy that this is all happening now in such a short time. If you are listening and haven't subscribed yet, I would ask you to please do so share with whoever you can and tell them to subscribe that would be awesome it goes a long way to helping me uh, helping the channel grow and working towards the dream of being able to do this full time thank you all and i will see you next time